السلام عليكم ورحمة الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأن محمد عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد We have quite a few questions which came I would kindly ask everyone to uh, give us the required silence um, question number one it says what are some reliable books or sheikhs on the topic of tafsir and seerah what are some of the reliable books on the topic of Tafsir or Seerah? The topic of Tafsir, the most reliable book, is Tafsir Ibn Kathir. Tafsir of Imam Ibn Kathir. That's the most reliable book. Tafsir Ibn Kathir is the most reliable book. And in English, we don't have the full version, but the author of Rahiq al Makhtum, the Sil Nectar, this same Sheikh, he summarized Tafsir ibn Kathir, he summarized it. And that summary is the translation we have of Ibn Kathir in English today. You know, you have seen the Tafsir ibn Kathir in English. There is a summary of Sheikh Safi al Rahman of Tafsir ibn Kathir. There is not all of Tafsir ibn Kathir, yet the summary came to 10 volumes in English. In Arabic, it's just one book like that. Tafsir ibn Kathir is the most reliable book in, in Tafsir. It's not the only good book, no. And if you want to read, then before that, I would suggest strongly you read Tafsir of Sheikh al-Sa'adi. Sheikh Abdul Rahman al-Sa'adi, it's a very simple tafsir, a book which is very beneficial. After that, there's the book, uh, Tahrir al-Tanweer of Ibn Ashur. It's a very good book. And then after that, you can read tafsir of Imam al-Tabari. These are some books in tafsir which are reliable books. Obviously, these are all in Arabic. I'm not talking about English. Only Ibn Kathir is available in English and some parts of Tafsir al-Sa'adi. In English, if you are to read Tafsir Ibn Kathir, it's more than enough. As for the Seerah, um, I have mentioned some books. And also the question came, what is this book I'm reading from? That is this book. I talked about it last time. Al-Lu'lu al-Maknoon fi Seerat al-Nabi al-Ma'moon of Sheikh uh, Musa ibn Rashid al-Azimi, who is a good brother who is in Kuwait. He took 10 years to write this book. This is volume one, and then there's three other volumes. It's four of them. Obviously, I'm sorry, but it's not available in English. Right? Um, also, other books which are good in Arabic is Asira al nabawiyya Sahihah of Dr. Akram al-Umari. And in English, this is the best book at the end of the day. But inshallah, we'll make some of the corrections that are needed and then we'll have the best book in English. And if you want to understand the seerah, then you should read the book called Zadul Ma'ad of Ibn Al-Qayyim. In English, it's available, it's called Provisions of the Hereafter. It's a very important book for you to understand the life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Zadul al Ma'ad Fi Hadi Khair al Ibad in Arabic. In English, it's called Provisions of the Hereafter. It's a very important book.
every time you walk into the, into the solar area of the masjid, do you have to pray two rak'ahs? Um, no, not every time. If you just went out quickly, you went to grab, you forgot your phone in your car, and then you came back, you don't have to pray tahiyyat al-masjid. You don't have to. What are the steps to take after one sins? After you seen the Prophet Sallallahu he said, the one who commits a sin, and then he goes and makes wudu, and prays two rak'ahs, Allah will forgive him his sins. And also, once you sin, you're supposed to regret your sin, and to make a resolution not to go back. And Allah forgives everything. How did Najashi communicate with Ja'far? And we said that they don't speak the same language. I did not mention the detail, but of course he had a translator. He had a translator. It's the same way how did Amr bin As and Abdullah bin Abi Rabi'a, the envoys of the Quraysh, how did they speak to them? They had translators. You never mentioned the story of the Prophet وسلم, going to Taif and that they stoned him. This is coming, not yet. It's going to come though. It's going to happen. Um, a Sheikh said that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, curses those who pierce their nose. I've never had that before. Is there Dalil supporting this? I never heard about it before also. The Prophet وسلم, never said anything like that, that those who pierce their nose, they're cast. Obviously, if a man does that, he is cast because now he's resembling women. Yeah, a man who resembles women is cast and a woman who resembles man is cast. But there's nothing wrong with women piercing their nose to wear a ring or whatever it is that they wear on their nose. There's nothing wrong with that. In some cultures, that is just a culture. There's nothing wrong with that. Is it, the question though is, should she go out with that, <laughs> without, <laughs> without piercing outside? The scholars, they differed actually. Some of them said, no, it's a beautification, she has to cover it. Some of them said, no, it's just another piercing on the nose, who cares? The question says, is it true that the Prophet وسلم, likes spiders? Or did the spiders help him? Question from a 10-year-old girl, mashallah. And she said, Masjid Rahman, with a high five and a star, hello. I'll put this in my pocket. The story of the spider is going to come soon. Whether it is correct or not, more than likely it never happened. More than likely it never happened. But Allahu A'lam, you know, some of the scholars, they said it happened. Many of the scholars said, no, it did not happen. You know what, again, it's one of those things which doesn't really make a difference yeah, in, in our religion. But does it mean the Prophet Sallallahu liked spiders? No. That's not the, the issue. The issue is, did it happen that the spider actually covered the cave with his web? And To be honest, I myself cannot come to a conclusion. I don't know. How do you know if a story is, is true or not? For example, how can I find if a story like the one of Umar's Islam is actually true? You come to my classes. No, the thing is, I, I've said this several times, the scholars, they wrote Sira, they collected everything, whatever was narrated. They did not bother to say this is true, this is not true. Their job, especially the previous scholars, the early scholars of Islam, their job was to collect for you. 
then your job is to go and examine is true or not. But what that, what that caused is that many people just started to read and said, oh, as long as Ibn Kathir wrote it, it's true. As long as Ibn Hajar wrote it, it's true. And he created a very bad thing, which people took whatever was in the books. But they never intended that. They intended for you to go and investigate yourself. So Alhamdulillah, what happened in the later years from like 1950 until today, the scholars of Islam, they went about filtering, verifying, cleaning the books of Islam from what is not authentic. And that is how we know. I myself, I told you, I was taught the story of Umar. Umar went and hit his sister and then he became Muslim. It's not true. You learn. How do you know you learn? How do you learn? I'm saying again in English, you don't have a book like that. In Arabic, there's a lot. This book I just mentioned, al Lul Maknoon, the book of Sheikh Akram al-Umari, Sira Nabawiya Sahiha, uh, the book Fiqh Sira of Sheikh al-Albani, the book of Al-Ghazali, authenticated by Sheikh al-Albani. You get to know the correct events, what really happened. That's how you know. Or you make sure you take your knowledge from people who they pay attention to this. Not just someone who wants to tell the story for the sake of the story. He doesn't verify. Is it true or not? No, it just sounds good. Let's tell it. No, don't take your Islamic knowledge from those kind of people. Make sure you take your knowledge from people who pay attention to that and say, no, I'm going just to teach people what is correct. What is not correct, I'm not teaching people that. How do you treat a family member who married a convert then went back to Christianity after marriage? The family member wants to stay with him. It is not allowed for a Muslim woman to be married to a non-Muslim man. What do you do for them? You advise them. You advise them with soft speech and good words and call them to do what is right and make dua for them. There's nothing much you can do. Does the discharge of a woman break the wudu? It is difficult to constantly make wudu in a public setting. It depends what kind of discharge it is. If it's the discharge which breaks the wudu, then yes, it breaks the wudu. Do you get possessed by jinns if you listen to music? 101%. It's not even a joke. 101%. Music is the adhan of the jinns. Music invites the jinns and the shayateen. It is so easy for you to be possessed once you start listening to music. Very easy. Those musicians themselves, they themselves, they confess that they are walking with the jinns and they are possessed. That's a fact. You can't deny it. So what is the true story for Islam of Umar al-Khattab? We say the story today. The Prophet ﷺ made dua for him and Islam entered his heart. There doesn't have to be a story, drama. Uthman ibn Affan anhu, was tortured by his uncle while married to Ruqayya. If so, did she ever get tortured? I don't know. Allahu A'lam. I have hormonal issues and my doctor prescribed bath control. Is this, humf- is this lawful? If your doctor is trustworthy, he or she is a good doctor, then that's what you need. You follow your doctor, not me. Medical situations, you ask the expert. You don't ask someone who's not an expert. If the medicine is what you need, that's what you need. I shop with my credit card often. If I pay the money back before interest is added, am I getting any sins? 
I wouldn't even answer it as a matter of sins or not. I would say just stay away from that because why are you taking the chance? What guarantee do you have that you can pay it off before you, the interest comes in? I would avoid because a credit card is basically you're taking a loan. That's what a credit card is. It's a credit card. Every time you use it, it's credit they're giving you and you have to pay it back. And they say to you, if you don't pay back, interest comes in. Why would you use a credit card if you have your own money? Why would you borrow money if you have your own money? That's the actual question. Just use your money. We know that buying life insurance is haram. What is the ruling on buying extended health insurance to cover things such as prescriptions and dental care? I don't know, Allahu A'lam. Allah says in the Quran, we do not send a messenger except with the language of his people. Because of shubuhat, some meaning doubt, some people who say Muhammad وسلم, was sent to the Arabs only. What would you say to these people to convince them otherwise? I told you today so many times, some things are very simple. This person who uses this verse to intend that the Prophet وسلم, was only sent to the Arabs, tell him or her, what about those other many verses of the Quran which say that he was sent to everybody? Why do you choose one verse and leave the rest? Well, this one doesn't even say only to the Arabs. This verse just says what? Every messenger was sent by the tongue of his people because they're the first ones to believe. They have to understand him. Allah says about his Prophet ﷺ, what? We sent you to all the human beings. Can genes hear you when you talk about them or think? How do you get possessed? Why are you laughing? Can genes hear you when you talk? Yes. Just like other human beings can hear you. They can hear. They are here, but we don't see them. They can hear, they can see you. It's simple. Can they, do they know what you think now? They don't know what you think. They don't know what you think. How do you get possessed? You get possessed once you leave the protection of Allah. How do you leave the protection of Allah? You don't pray. You listen to music. You're always in haram, especially major sins. You're drinking alcohol, you're gambling, zina, fornication, girlfriend, boyfriend, whatever. The shaitan, your easy prey. Pray, P-R-E-Y. Why? Because you're not guarded. You're not protected. You're not protected. You're easy for him. Easy. While the one who's protected, the Prophet ﷺ example, he said, the one who prays Salatul Fajr in Jama'ah, he's under the protection of Allah until tomorrow. The one who does his adhkar in the morning, the one who reads Ayatul Kursi in the morning, he is protected until the evening. And the one who reads it in the evening is protected until the morning. If you don't protect yourself, then you'll get possessed. Simple. But you have to know something. The jinns, they watch for you. Questions are written, all of them. They want to... Uh, put fear into you. Once you're, you're afraid of them, then they possess you. The jinns, they fear human beings. Muslims, strong Muslims. Remember the hadith of Umar? When the shaitan sees you coming from one way, it goes the other way. The scholars say that is not just for Umar. Anyone who can reach at that strong level of iman is the same thing. So that is your protection. If you don't have protection, you are inviting the jinns. And it, it can only happen, it can only happen if Allah wants it to happen. It's not like the genes, they control things. No, they don't control anything. Look at it just like any other disease. If Allah wants to test you with any other disease, he tests you. 
Sometimes someone can be praying, he does his adhkar, and he can be possessed. It's just a test. It's just a test. Tell you? But number one, you should be attached to Allah and not be afraid. Because Allah says in the Quran, Inna kayda shaytani kana da'ifa. The plots of the shaytan are weak. But you should not be weak. You should be always doing dhikr connected to Allah. If your parents tell you to cut the ties, to cut ties off with your siblings, and you don't do that, will Allah punish you? No. Allah will not punish you for obeying Him. Allah will punish you if you disobey Him. You only obey your parents in what is obedience to Allah. Just like the story of Sa'ad bin Abi Waqas we read, his, his mother said what? I will not eat food, I will not drink until I die, unless you leave this religion of Muhammad And then people will put you to shame and say Sa'ad the one who killed his mother. Was he supposed to obey him? You only obey any human being in what is obedience to Allah. So when your mother, your father, they tell you to cut off your relatives or to go drink alcohol or to do anything which is haram, you don't obey them. You don't obey them. And you do it in a nice way so they understand. You don't start a war. Maybe they don't understand. In the hadith of Aisha, you said Surah 96, Surah Al-Alaq, Iqra, Bismi Rabbika, Alladhi Khalaq, 1 to 5, verse 1 to 5 was revealed. But in the narration I found it was 1 to 3. No, it is actually 1 to 5. The first five verses of the 96th chapter, Surah Al-Alaq, Iqra, that was the first Quran to be revealed. How are you? I'm brilliant, fantastic, tired. How do I go to Jannah Firdaus, Ya Allah? That's the most difficult question to answer. You can see, I can just simply say, be a good Muslim, but how do you go to Jannah Firdaus? That's a very difficult question. They came and they asked the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Ya Rasulullah, man naja, the hadith of Uqba, how do I save myself? He said three things. He said, Amsik alayka lisanak, control your tongue. It's the most difficult thing to do, by the way, especially for women. It's a fact. Control your tongue. No backbiting, no lying, no cheating, no slandering, no disobeying. Whoever you have to obey, no being ungrateful, it's the most difficult thing to do. Amsik alayka lisana, control your tongue. Number two, wabki ala khati'atik, cry for the sins you committed. Meaning always repent and always ask Allah to forgive you. And number three, wal yasa'aka baytak, let your house accommodate you. Meaning stay in your house, don't go just outside every day because there's so much fitna. Meaning do worship, Worship Allah in your house. That is how you save yourself. Meaning stay in your house. Let your house accommodate you. Don't be every day. You have to be outside with people. You need time just between you and Allah. Can a man marry a non-Muslim woman? A Muslim man is allowed to marry a Christian or a Jewish woman who is chaste. Chaste meaning they are not evil women who have boyfriends and girlfriends. It is allowed for them to marry that. Those are the two conditions. How do we know when we are ready to get married? You'll know. You'll know.
That's funny. Only the single brothers are laughing. The ones who are married, they're like, yeah. What am I supposed to say? How do you know? How do I? Do you know you got your right to get married? You'll know. One day you'll know. You'll wake up and say, okay, it's time now. That's what happened to me. One day I woke up and said, okay, I need to get married now. Simple. In the end of Surah, Surah Maryam, Allah says, and they say, Ar Rahman, the most merciful, has taken a son. Why does Allah use this name, Ar Rahman, and not any other name? Well, that's a very good question. I'll do my research and get back to you, inshallah. I don't know right now. It's a very good question. Why did Allah use the name Ar Rahman and not any other names? Because we know the Quran is not random, every word is in its right place. So Allah used Ar Rahman, why not Al Aziz? Why not Allah? I will do my research and get back to you, inshallah. You can watch next week's Q&A. This Q&A is live right now on YouTube. Every Sunday we have live Q&A. Just go to my YouTube channel and you can watch and your questions are answered then. There's a lot of questions already on YouTube actually. Allah, 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 Allah.